this is part of our lecture series on public space um, for students at the Welsh School of Architecture. Um, and today we've got with us Leslie Kern. Um, so thank you very much for, for being here. Um, she is the Associate Professor of Geography and Environment and Director of Women's and Gender Studies at Mount Allison University in Sackville, um, New Brunswick, Canada. She is the author of two books on gender and cities, including Feminist City. Um, in Feminist City, through history, personal experience and popular culture, Leslie Kern exposes what is hidden in plain sight, the social inequalities um, built into our cities, homes and neighbourhoods. Um, and Kern offers an alternate vision of the feminist city. Um, and her next book is coming out in 2022, at, and it's an intersectional guide to gentrification. So keep an eye out for that. Um, so take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me to be here today. It's a real pleasure. Let me just pull up my slides for you one moment. So as Patrick said, I'm joining you today from Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, which is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I uh, give thanks for the opportunity to live and work and learn on this land. My pronouns are she, her, and you can find me on social media if you want to, at Lely K. The image on the front slide is the um, pretty recently released paperback version of Feminist City. So if you're interested in picking up the book, Verso now has this uh, really, really nice paperback edition out. So I'm sure that they would be happy that I mentioned that. So uh, I really appreciate being invited here today. Of course, I'm not an architect or a planner or anyone really who's directly involved in the building of cities. So I'm not here to you know, tell you what you uh, should do as architects or soon to be architects, but I hope that I can share maybe what I, what I see as some of the built-in assumptions that implicitly structure how uh, city building happens, the kinds of priorities that we set and to think about what some principles and values might be that could sort of shift our thinking and, and shift directions, if you will, in, in terms of a, a more equitable, just, and sustainable city. So one of the first questions that we can start out with is this very general one, who is the city for? And of course, it uh, has a kind of obvious opposite question, who is the city not for? I think ideally we, and I would imagine most people uh, who are directly involved in city building would say everyone, the city is for everyone. But in reality, urban planning, building design and urban policy has centered and universalized men. And at that, a particular kind of man or, or um, subcategory of man, if you will, an economic man, a breadwinner, a cisgendered, able-bodied, white, productive man. So when I talk about the idea of the man-made city, some of the things that I'm uh, trying to get at include the fact that in, in most places, planning, urban design, architecture, and urban policymaking are male-dominated professions. Planning is, is a little more gender balanced, but in, in most places, Canada, the US, the UK, for example, architecture is still um, heavily male dominated, not at the student level. In fact, in many places, there are more young women as architecture students, but when we get to the stage of actually being licensed practicing architects, that number drops to like a quarter in some places. So I'm sure you know better than I do some of the reasons for that. Um, I could talk about them, but I kind of don't want to tell you uh, something that you probably already know. In design, typically the male body, again, a, a particular kind of male body is taken as a universal standard. The, um, the size, the, the, the height, the weight, um, 
the, the physical capacity and so on of the male body is taken as the norm around which um, all sorts of everyday and not so everyday objects and places are designed. And the city itself is set up to prioritize uh, what is or maybe was a typical male pattern of movement. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but the kind of the idea of the nine to five city of someone commuting from the suburbs or residential area into the central city in a linear pattern at particular times of the day, that is uh, not a pattern that has really reflected women's experiences and continues to be uh, kind of a long-standing problem in the city. And more generally, I think the gendered assumptions about things like home, work, public, private, and more really saturate our buildings and cities. And that's uh, kind of the reason why I wrote Feminist City was just as a, a, a way of introducing to people who maybe it doesn't seem intuitive to think about the gendered assumptions that lie behind, you know, the, the train route that they're on or uh, the way that a particular intersection is set up. But once you see it, you kind of can't unsee it. And of course, I want to acknowledge that I am far from the first person to be talking about these issues. The image on the screen is the cover of uh, a book from, I believe, 1984 called Making Space, Women in the Man-Made Environment from the UK-based Matrix Collective. Uh, I love the quote on the front cover, a stiff challenge to the great macho myths of metropolitan architecture. So people have been talking about this for a long time and it goes even further back than, than Matrix. Uh, women and, and feminists have been concerned about the way that the designs of homes, buildings, neighborhoods, and, and whole cities themselves have really held women back from the public sphere. So um, the things that I'm talking about today definitely are not only the result of you know, something that, that I came up with, but I'm building on a really long tradition of people uh, sharing these critiques. So I mentioned a moment ago that um, a, a notion of a typical standard male body is taken as the norm in urban design. Now, I would argue that in many cases, it seems as though the human body or basic human needs have not been considered at all in a lot of design principles, but to the extent that the human body is considered, uh, an idea of an average male body is taken as the standard. So height, weight, strength, comfortable temperatures, and more are set to normal for a male body. And in the image on the screen, you see a, a crowded uh, subway car and anyone who's ever tried to you know, reach up to the center bar to grab that will know that you know, based on your height, it's probably going to be accessible more often for men than it is for women. That's just one, one example, but uh, these kinds of things uh, abound throughout um, urban environments. I'm sure uh, many of you will be familiar with the, the work of Carolyn Crado Perez and her really interesting book, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Some of the things that, that she exposes in this book, uh, women having higher rates of workplace injuries, illnesses, and deaths. Of course, this is not because women are just somehow so weak and are prone to just dropping dead. At, in the workplace, this is because the workplace and, and work equipment and work environments have not really been designed with women's needs or women's health in mind. Indeed, again, a male body has been taken as the standard. So standard male norms calculate things like the risk <clears throat> of chemical exposure. So what amount of a chemical exposure is considered acceptable? Well, it's what's considered acceptable for an adult male body of a certain size and women on average are, are going to be different than that. We've also seen, you know, during the pandemic, for example, that things like safety equipment don't necessarily fit women well or have not been designed with women's bodies in mind. So, you know, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers um, doesn't fit women's faces and bodies as well. But this can extend up to, you know, spacesuits for astronauts, uh, bulletproof vests for police officers and military personnel that are not designed, for example, with the body of someone who has breasts and uh, hips in mind. And many safety tests that are done on our cars and other kinds of equipment are only done with men or with kind of typical male-sized dummies. 
So what this results in is just kind of a world that is like literally physically not built for the average or, or the majority of women. And I'm not saying that it suits every man well, well either. It's, it's an average that probably, um, depending on where you're from and, and all sorts of other factors, is not necessarily ideal. But definitely there's a, a serious gender uh, bias in how things are designed. And as Perez points out in her book, there's so much that we don't even know because they haven't even done the research to find out, for example, what an acceptable risk of a particular chemical exposure would be for women versus men. We can also start to ask the question, whose lives are the norms? I've talked a little bit about whose bodies are the norms, but perhaps um, you know, more interesting from, from my point of view as social human urban geographer is this question of whose day-to-day -day experiences are taken as the norm around which urban space, urban environments and buildings should be designed. And if you look at the four images on the screen, we have like a, a New York brownstone, a, a steep set of steps down to uh, a subway system, porta potties as we call them here in North America, little you know portable public toilets and a pedestrian underpass that goes underneath a, a busy street. And depending on your gender, you're likely to have somewhat different reactions just to these images. So you might look at that pedestrian underpass and if you're a woman, you might think, yeah, there's no way I'm walking under that at night. Or you might think, gee, I'd really like to be able to walk under that, but what if something happens? Um, are there lights in there? Can I get cell reception? Uh, would it be easier to, you know, go up and cross the street? If you look at the bathroom, for example, I mean, I probably don't have to go into a lot of detail about why for many women, this is going to be like an ex extremely unpleasant and difficult environment to use. If you look at the steps down to the subway system, if you are traveling with children or a stroller or you have a disability, this is going to be a very daunting environment. And even the ever so charming New York brownstone, if you uh, need to get a toddler, a stroller, and a load of groceries into that delightful New York brownstone, and I suppose you don't have your nanny with you, then that would probably also be a kind of difficult environment to, to make its way through. Now, one of the major factors beyond just sort of bodies or socialization into you know, what's considered safe and not safe is the reality of caregiving responsibilities. And that reality is going to be partly what determines whether these and other environments seem friendly, accessible, useful, safe, and so on. So when I, we talk about care work, uh, for me, I'm talking about all of the unpaid and often underpaid labor that keeps human beings clean, fed, rested, healthy, and supported. And this can include you know, domestic work, like the work that you do around the house, child care, elder care, emotional and mental labor, everything that falls under that old Marxist category of social reproduction, right? All the work that is done to basically reproduce the workforce to go out and uh, work in the, the public sphere. Uh, you might be aware of, of this uh, book by British author Gemma Hartley called Fed Up, Emotional Labor Women and the Way Forward. And I definitely don't recommend reading this book if you just want like a nice calm read that's not going to leave you feeling well fed up as the title of the book would suggest, particularly if you are uh, a woman who lives with men or is in heterosexual relationships because you will probably just end up feeling extremely frustrated and uh, perhaps disappointed in, in a whole range of things in reading the book. But nonetheless, it's a really, it's, it's a good um, sort of primer on the world of emotional labor and um, you know, Hartley uh, tries to make a case for why care labor should be done by uh, everyone. But one of the things that <clears throat> tends to happen and, and not necessarily in, in her book, but the conversation about care work kind of devolves into this conversation about, oh, well, you know, this is just something that needs to be like negotiated within the space of the heterosexual nuclear family rather than something might that might be a broader public issue. 
So when we think about public space, public spaces, buildings, and so on, often we find that care work is an afterthought. So I would be curious to know, maybe we can talk about it later in the discussion, how often is care work centered in your design processes? Is it something that is a consideration at all? Is it something that you know, comes up maybe later in the process? Is it something that you think about when you consider who the users are uh, in your space? And, you know, I would note from my own kind of occasional nerdy glimpsing through urban and regional plans that, especially in North America, care work is almost never mentioned in urban and regional plans. It seems like it's assumed that this is private work that's happened in private spaces, and therefore it's a private problem. So like I was saying before, it kind of becomes cast as like a battle of the sexes that's going to take place in the home. It's a private issue for heterosexual couples to fight over and sort out and negotiate and uh, maybe get divorced over, right? But how far does this conceptualization of care work really get us? I would argue that it hasn't really got us very far in, in decades, if not centuries of um, posing it as this sort of problem for uh, particular individual relationships. Now, that's not to let any men off the hook. Obviously, uh, the vast majority of men could be doing a lot more in this realm, in the home. But at the end of the day, I think it's also a problem that we need to think about in a much more public and collective way. So in terms of, you know, care work, being brought into the world of urban planning and design, some questions that you know that I'm interested in in asking might include things like, are school journeys prioritized in transportation design? Um, is there space for children in strollers on subways and buses? Um, are transit networks designed to connect spaces of care? Are domestic workers? considered workers and are their needs in the city considered? And more generally, are spaces for care prioritized? In the image that I have on this screen, we can see um, someone that, that from the image, I presume to be a man who's you know crouched down on um, an outdoor pavement to change the diaper of a small child, presumably because there is um, no baby care facilities in a nearby restroom, which is often the case that those facilities are not available in binary gender bathrooms where uh, men's bathrooms don't have those facilities. It's probably also likely that there's just no public toilet at all because in many cities, public toilets have you know been all but kind of taken away entirely. And so we, we kind of have no space for care here and he's forced to improvise by uh, setting up on the ground. And as someone who uh, is a parent, I can attest to the kind of regular necessity of, of having to just improvise and create your own care spaces because they're simply not provided for in the urban environment. So what sustains this exclusion, this kind of hiving off of care work into the private realm and kind of forgetting about it, not thinking about it as part of uh, public design processes, uh, part of it is, I, I think, a set of kind of lurking assumptions that are coded often into binaries. In, in Western thought, we really love a, a binary, right? We love kind of dualistic thinking. Uh, like any good feminist, you know, I, I, my educational background is in women's and gender studies, so I've been trained to pay attention to binaries and these sort of dualistic and oppositional ways that we think and um, the ways that we structure how we make sense of the world, basically. So I'm not going to go through all of these in any detail. I just put them up as some examples of binaries that I think probably are present, if you will, in uh, the world of, of urban thought. So homework, family versus friends, public versus private, young versus old, safety versus danger, care versus work, natural versus human. Now, you don't need to have a degree in women's studies like I do to notice that there is an assumed gender binary that can be mapped onto many of these examples. So the persistent gender division of labor, for example, is a norm that lies unquestioned at uh, the heart of things like public-private, care, work, and home and work. Interestingly, 
uh, COVID-19 has both collapsed and exploded some of the boundaries between these categories while also exposing the instability of a system that relies on keeping care work hidden in the private space of the home and as the purview of, of women. So in many ways, we could talk about COVID-19 as a care crisis. It's, it's a variety of kinds of crises, but I think it is certainly a care crisis. And some of the things that have um, emerged, again, none of these are like news, but it still felt like for many people, there was a, a re-recognition of some of these long-standing issues. So care work has remained what I would say deliberately hidden and invisible within the private family home. I say deliberately because the whole system kind of relies on it being unpaid and undervalued. Uh, men still do not do a full share of childcare and housework, uh, public care work. So work that people uh, do uh, as waged work has been underpaid, undervalued, stigmatized, and has fallen to the most marginalized groups in society. Um, assumptions about who does care work run rampant in policymaking in every sector. I think we would see this in examples, um, you know, from, from lockdown, for, for example, when it was just assumed that there would be somebody at home to homeschool children, right, or to look after children during the day that uh, parents, including women, would not be essential workers who had to be out of the home. And finally, and perhaps most relevantly for our discussion here today, public space has not really been considered part of the care work picture. So it hasn't really been seen as a potential area of intervention or a site of a solution to these ongoing uh, care work problems. So in thinking then about moving towards a vision of a feminist city, what are some areas of intervention that one might um, take on? So as, as a set of first steps, or maybe first principles for, um, for people to pay attention to, one would be to um, recognize what already exists. So as I mentioned a moment ago, there's often a lot of improvisation in the use of urban space around uh, care work, around social activities, um, all sorts of things, right? People make urban environments into what they need them to be, or they create organizations, structures, um, mutual aid, all kinds of things to get their needs met. So for folks who are in, you know, design and planning professions, it's important not to, you know, swoop in and say, oh, we're going to fix everything we know what you need, but to first recognize what is probably already been being done on the ground, because wherever problems exist, people are usually working uh, or trying to come up with solutions. Secondly, that whatever approaches we take have to be intersectional. And by that, I mean that, although I've been primarily talking about gender today, that that is certainly not a homogenous category. Women is not some kind of universal category where all women experience the city in the same ways. Um, and to me, an intersectional approach is most valuable when it kind of starts from the position of those who are most marginalized. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, the idea of care networks, not care boxes. So to me, the way that we currently organize society into you know, single family homes, that's a kind of a care box, right? Care is being done in this like little individualized box. But to me, I think we need to start imagining care work is happening in a very broadly networked sense that includes not just people and organizations, but particular spaces as well. And to that end or related to that is the idea of like blowing up the home and the family or, or the, the traditional nuclear family. Uh, by this, I, I don't mean that, you know, nobody is allowed to live in a single family home, but that we can really work hard to expand the notion of what counts as a family, what legitimate homes look like, um, all sorts of different ways of people living in relation to one another, to uh, the non-human world that really go beyond what I would say are, are incredibly narrow um, prescriptions for what these things should look like. 
and above all, you know, making it collective. So as I said, the care work, the solution to the care work dilemma cannot just come as a, um, you know, psychological battle of wills in the, the, the heterosexual family home. It has to be thought about in a, in a collective sense. So when I mentioned an intersectional perspective coming from the perspective of those who are most marginalized, I think it's quite valuable to work with the principle of bringing the margin to the center. Um, I think that all too often in design processes, there's an idea of the quote unquote normal user. And for a very long time, that has been that cisgender, able-bodied, economically productive uh, man, right? And everybody else was considered to be marginal or a niche or uh, a special interest group of some sort. Yet when you take all of those so-called niche groups together, they actually form the majority, right? Uh, so just because people are, for example, considered to be vulnerable in some way, maybe they're elderly, have a disability, are low income, are recent immigrants, whatever it might be, does not mean that they are somehow niche and that their needs should be worried about at some kind of later stage or that they will be built in as a kind of special concession to this vulnerability. Rather, if we start from the point of view of, okay, what would um, make this city or a particular building accessible, fun, interesting, safe, useful for senior citizens, for parents of young children, for people who use wheelchairs, for low income people, then we kind of build that intersectional equity-based approach in from the ground up. So to me, that means let's bring the margin to the center. And I suppose I should note on that, you know, this is not about then saying that, oh, uh, somehow like men will be discarded and forgotten about and they'll just be, they won't be allowed to ride the train or something ridiculous like that. No, of course not. <laughs> but the point is that those who are already pretty privileged will be fine. They won't lose anything. And in fact, they also stand to gain a lot because for example, we will all age, right? So at some point we all need greater accessibility. Um, so it, it's not about displacing someone or, or creating a new hierarchy, and pushing men to the bottom. It's about seeing the way in which taking this margin to center perspective actually lifts everybody up. Uh, people often ask me, oh, what are things that like cities or designers or architects could do like right away that maybe don't cost that much money or um, can, you know, don't require like decades of, of planning or a giant bulldozer kind of intervention. So I like to say, well, you could start with the symbolic. Now, I think we don't stop with the symbolic, but we can start with the symbolic. So this could be everything from the way that streets, buildings, parks, and plazas are named. It could have to do with um, how women and other marginalized groups are represented in public space in terms of the monuments that we have, the flags that we fly, uh, the languages that are represented, um, the bodies that are represented, the stories that we put on plaques to explain, you know, why this park is here or the significance of this particular building. The, the stories that we tell through the urban environment are powerful. They, they tell a strong story about who belongs, right, about whose lives matter. And so, you know, last summer when we saw around the world um, during the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, people taking to the streets to like physically topple or behead or dismantle statues of colonizers and slave owners and um, basically genocidal maniacs. I mean, the statue that you see being removed here is from the city of Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, this man, Edmund Cornwallis, who uh, famously had a bounty on Mi'kmaq scalps, but his statue stood prominently in this park in the center of the city until finally, after you know many years of protest, the city removed it. It's, it's in storage somewhere while they figure out what to do about this person. So we can start with the symbolic. 
Um, in terms of this idea of kind of like blowing up the home or collectivizing care work, I think we can start to use our um, very powerful imaginations to uh, revisit and reinvent some of the ways that we do things that are both kind of inefficient, not very sustainable, and are exploitative of certain people's labor. So can we imagine public spaces used for community kitchens, right, to feed great numbers of people and to perhaps cut down on real scourges like food waste and overconsumption of energy and water resources in the home? Can we reimagine outdoor public spaces as spaces for children's learning and schooling to happen in, right? So this is part of that process of thinking about how do we take care work that is so often hidden in the home or, or hidden away in spaces uh, that's so often done by women or other marginalized groups for very little money and bring it into the public sphere, not always outside, although outside can be great, but into any kind of public realm so that we can you know, revalue it, we can recognize it, we can see it where it's happening and we can perhaps um, see it as something that we both all require and that we can all participate in. The other thing that I like to say that is kind of an obvious point, but is often lost, I think, in a lot of um, design professions is the fact that people have bodies and that there are different kinds of bodies. So what would it look like to start from the body in a design process to start with the recognition that we all have certain needs and that many of these needs are fairly universal. We all need to use the bathroom. We all need places to rest. We all need shelter and shade. At times we need warmth, at times we need it to be cool. We need access to water and, and food. Um, we need spaces that feel safe and, and restful. In many cases, our urban environments have been kind of hollowed out of these sorts of spaces, whether it's due to fears of homeless people using benches or bathrooms, fears of terrorism or crime. Many of our urban environments have become really hardened, right? Really kind of anti-human. I think many people noticed this more during the pandemic when our leaders were telling us to take our social activities outdoors. It's safer outdoors. Um, you know, why don't you, you know, meet friends or gather in parks or public spaces? Sure, people tried to do that. They found there's nowhere to go to the toilet. There's nowhere to sit comfortably. There's all of these just kind of like hard concrete spaces, there's over surveillance and over policing. Um, it's simply not very pleasant to be out in a lot of urban public spaces. And I think that's because we've kind of ripped the humanity out of them. So we can start to put the human factor back in. And of course, to remember that it's not a one size fits all approach. So we need things like um, restrooms that reflect uh, the diversity of gender identities, the diversity of caregiving needs that uh, might need to uh, be fulfilled in those sorts of spaces, right? So one way to do this would be to get community members, you know, involved in planning processes to figure out what they would like, what would be enjoyable, useful, what they could use for different sorts of purposes. Um, rather than, again, you know, designers deciding that they know all of the answers ahead of time. So to wrap up then, I, I do strongly believe that many facets of a gender equity approach benefit a wide range of people. So it's not about saying that, well, the man has been the universal standard for too long. So let's just replace him with um, a female version of that universal standard. No, it does have to go deeper than that, right? So a true equity approach is looking for those who have been the most excluded, the most marginalized over time and figuring out what would benefit them. And by figuring out, I do also mean, you know, asking them, right? Speaking to people, <laughs> learning from, from people, seeing what people are already doing. And through that kind of approach, 
we we can come up with with solutions, designs, um, things that are beneficial to large groups of of people, and and doesn't really, you know, demote anybody, if you will. And and to me, centering care work is one of the ways that we can start to shift that. And it's not about okay, well, let's center care work just to make women's lives a little bit easier. It's about centering care work so that we can really recognize all of our mutual interdependence, recognize our mutual responsibilities towards one another, and to recognize the fact that none of what we have, the economy, as we, the economy, this big thing that we're all supposed to sacrifice ourselves for, uh, it wouldn't exist without all of that care work that, that happens. Um, so, invisibly and, and under such exploitative conditions. So if we can all understand that collective responsibility and you know, kind of a spatial and design approach to that, it's not the whole picture. Obviously we need policy, we need social change, uh, but it's part of the picture. It's, it's one big piece of the puzzle and one potential area of intervention. Okay, that um, brings me to the end of, of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So yeah. anyone who has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we already have one question by Hannah that says, how do you think a balance could be found between the systemic benefits for women, the elderly and vulnerable in a city such as Stockholm, which in her experience, of living there seems to lack person-to-person -person care, relying instead on state. And the neighborly care born out of struggle and the failure of state provision of architectures of care in, for example, the UK or the US. How can we build or maintain an architecture of care on both state and community levels? Yeah, that's a really great question. I'm not sure I can, really give, give an answer to it, except to say that uh, we probably require both, right? We're, we're not um, necessarily going to be able to um, accomplish the changes that need to happen or even just um, to really organize the you know, care work in a systemic way without the state. Uh, but if we completely rely on the state or wait for the state, then a lot of things uh, fall through the cracks. And of course, there's a lot of problems in many places with the way that the state provides care, whether it's, you know, very uh, like mean and miserly approaches to uh, who can qualify for disability benefits, for example, and um, things that really like are designed to make those processes very like hostile and uh, humiliating for people involved in them. Whereas something like mutual aid is uh, not designed to do that. So I think it's the moment we definitely need both. I mean, to me, the, the benefit of maybe expanding or you know creating more opportunities and spaces for that kind of neighborly care or mutual aid is that there's more potential for it to be kind of horizontal, like less hierarchical, right? Less about those who have more or those who are in power deciding who needs help and what they're going to get and more about a recognition that everybody needs something and also everybody has something to offer, right? That there is not one category of people that is independent and self-sufficient and another that is dependent and vulnerable, but that, you know, we are all vulnerable. I mean, if the pandemic uh, didn't teach us that then you know what else what else could it teach us that you know we to some extent we all have uh, basic human needs that need to be fulfilled so I'm sorry I realize I'm not really answering your question but I you know I don't really see it as as an either or um, uh, not at this time anyways thank you um, I have a question is there any city, location, a building, anything that you have seen like architecture wise that you consider 
contemporary and innovational in terms of inclusivity that we could look as like a precedent or an example? That's a good question. I probably should have prepared for that given who I was speaking to <laughs> today, but um, obviously it's not entirely my area of, of expertise. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm kind of drawing a blank. It's not something that I like have a list handy. It's okay, of, <laughs> it's okay. Those sorts of spaces, yeah. I've got a question sort of related to that. Um, Cause I think an approach which we've looked at a bit recently in our design projects um, has been co-housing. Um, so like where you have shared spaces which are used between several households. Um, and, and also services. So whether that's sharing care and stuff as well. Um, so I was wondering, do you think that could in part as like a method of architecture um, ease pressure on the care crisis you were talking about? And yeah, do you think that would then have a follow on effect to like the more urban areas? Um, yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think co-housing is is one of those options that could certainly be expanded. And I think there is there's kind of a hunger for it, but it's not a form of housing that, you know, like in the private housing market that developers really want to build or take a risk on, at least not at this particular moment. So a lot of what we're seeing is I think people uh, kind of like DIYing it in a way. So you hear these stories in the news, at least over here sometimes of like a group of seniors has sort of banded together and they bought like um, a, a large house or a property where they can build like, or, or put, you know, two or three like tiny houses or small houses on so that they can create kind of like their own co-housing, co-living situation, which <clears throat> as you say, has those benefits of being able to share um, you know, kitchen, garden, social space, uh, laundry, all of those facilities that right now we, you know, divide up into millions and millions of, of separate homes. Uh, I think in many places, seniors are kind of driving that because they are, you know, don't want necessarily want to be isolated on their own, but people are not necessarily ready to go into long-term care, but there's not a lot of in-between options, right? So, that's a, a demographic that is picking up on that, but but young families as well who, yeah, can see the benefit of having like multiple um, adult eyes on on children or of um, you know the efficiency, if you will, of um, preparing meals for five or ten people rather than two or three people at a time. Uh, so I think. Yes, is the, the short answer to the question. And then the, the but is, I think, probably given uh, in most places the, the privatized nature of housing construction, it probably will require a little bit of government incentivizing in the form of tax breaks, whatever it might be to get developers to actually build that sort of space. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, that makes sense because it's, it's very easy for us in architecture school to just say right this is going to be a co-housing project but we we're not having to deal directly with developers and stuff yet so yeah i think yeah it would be good if we could uh probably get taught more how to deal with developers and maybe um sort of figure out our just how to persuade people at, that this is a good idea as well um yeah, and I have another question. So we obviously use like all these standards for for spaces which are built around men. Do you know any standards which are are built for other people which aren't men, basically? Like like do you know if there's anyone doing any work to to make standards for non-male bodies? Um, 
so interestingly, I mean, it's it's not a field that I uh, have ever known much about, but the field of ergonomics, right, which is the study of kind of like how bodies move and um, is very much related to like workplace stuff. So there is kind of like a subfield of like feminist or like gender based ergonomics that looks at these things like in very detailed ways in workplaces like um, what is the weight of particular tools, for example, or what is the like um, what are the day to day like lifting requirements, for example, of personal care workers in a hospital, right? Like what, how much weight do they have to lift? So there in, in that field, there is work that's being done to try to like figure out the, these different kind of like occupational standards with a recognition that many occupations are still very gender segregated, right? So we do have to pay attention to that. But um, yeah, I mean, I'll put in the chat, there's a recent book. I'm not, I'm not sure if it would be available in the UK yet, but probably I think it's called um, Bent Out of Shape by Karen Messing. I'll have a look at that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to had a follow up question in my head, but it's just left me. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, sorry, it's not that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess any other questions? Actually, no, it was, it was more of a follow up comment. It was more just, um, yeah, so we we have to take these standards with a pinch of salt when we're we're looking at them and designing our buildings. Um, yeah, and I think I think we we do that a bit anyway, because standards are very binary in a lot of senses. But I think it's definitely another sense we need to be taking these standards with a pinch of salt in. Um, but yeah, I think there's another comment. Oh yeah, the field of universal design addresses this. I'm not familiar with it, but it may have standards around those different bodies slash abilities. Okay, I'll have a look at that as well. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, some, some cities are trying to take universal design principles and apply them on a broad scale. So Singapore, for example, is um, in recognition that, you know, like many places, they have a rapidly aging population. Um, and as we age, we tend to require more like accessibility accommodations in terms of our mobility and so on. So they've taken to making sure that, you know, as many like train stations as possible are like wheelchair or mobility device accessible. There's uh, braille on the handrails. There's, you know, signal, different signals for, um, you know, like lighting signals for if you have um, hearing loss and, you know, audio signals if you uh, have vision loss, right? Like, so those kinds of things that are uh, meant to make space as accessible as possible for people. So yeah, universal design is, is a, great, a great example, yeah. There's also the field of, and it doesn't, it's not quite about standards, but there's the field of design justice as well, which, um, you know, is, is conceives of design broadly. It could be everything from, you know, like apps on your phone to, you know, entire buildings to systems and, and organizations. But again, it kind of takes this principle that if you, uh, kind of start with an equity perspective, then you may end up somewhere very different than what a traditional design process would look like. And it starts with the recognition that in most cases, design processes, even if they appear kind of neutral and, and objective, are biased in various ways. So everything from, you know, algorithms that are like racially biased, for example, and, you know, all of these things that are kind of like almost invisible right? We don't really see the way that an algorithm is biased, but because humans built it <laughs> and it learns from humans, it is biased. So, you know, the first step is kind of like trying to recognize where those biases are in design processes and then 
trying to work work around them or work differently. Yeah, that that's a really interesting point. And I think like going back to what you said in the lecture about um, bringing the the border of what you sorry i'm trying to find i wrote it down <laughs> um but sort of bringing the the margins of the center margins the margins of to the center that's what i was looking for thank you yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah but yeah i think if we don't have any more questions um yeah, thank you very much for, for coming and giving this lecture for us. And thank you for accepting our invitation. It was really, really helpful. Thank you. And thanks for answering some of our questions as well. Like, it's been really interesting to hear your perspective on some of those. Um, I've definitely got a couple of things I need to go away and look at now, um, which is Great. always good. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, you're very welcome. I appreciate the invitation and it was a, it was a pleasure to join you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.